MTV used to only show music videos, Cartoon Network never used to play live action programming, and the History Channel, if you can believe it, was about history. But somewhere along the way, it seems those executives realized that all those Ken Burns-style documentaries about Napoleon, Nazis, and more Nazis just wasn't bringing in the dollar. Because around 2010, the History Channel decided to pivot towards, well, not history. They turned their eyes away from the Earth and towards the stars. Programs about aliens may have been the final thing to turn this once reputable academic channel into a punchline, but scheduling shows that go against its core principles didn't fall far from the sky. But to understand fully how the History Channel eventually decided that it's not possible to make history funny and interesting, we need to explore the history of the History Channel. Thankfully, one of the great things about history is our ability to learn from it, and this channel was created to thrive where they fell short. So it's time to learn how history works, to understand how to build a history channel that actually tells history in a funny and interesting way, so that we too don't have to pivot to a reality show about pawn shops. It's January 1st, 1995, and the History Channel launches as a basic cable station for packages worldwide. This was right at the time when satellite and cable providers realized that hyper-niche channels such as the Golf Channel and the infamous Fireplace Channel would be able to isolate their core audience without having to compete for airtime. The likes of National Geographic and Discovery proved that entertainment with value was a viable commodity in this new wild west of television. So it only made sense that some producers would come along to monopolize a corner of the market that focuses on all things history. Yet, even back then, the channel knew that they couldn't just go all in with educational docs about Eskimos and Nazis. Inspector Gadget's field trip utilized a beloved Saturday morning cartoon character to lead a show for younger viewers. Here, the eponymous mechanical Buffon explored different places around the globe. Granted, there would be historical insight, but this overlap with geography wasn't a move on National Geographic turf, but a sign that even in 1996, the History Channel was prepared to use history as a subcategory to any other topic, like a Venn diagram of niches. History Channel's Lost and Found catered towards memorabilia collectors and auctioneers by digging up the past of historically significant items. The Food That Built America catered, literally, for foodies and budding chefs by diving into the backstory of America's favorite foods, and spam. Ancients Behaving Badly took a more sensational look at historical figures with bad reps, clearly as a way to pull in true crime fans and soap opera watchers. And Extreme Trains was for, you know, people who like trains. But the first notable occasion when the History Channel's namesake was becoming an afterthought was in Modern Marvels. Clearly, modern is not a synonym of history, and indeed, it was contrived to explore the history of technology in the modern era because despite the show's occasional glance at the Eiffel Tower, it felt like the show was more tech-focused. Are contemporary roller coasters and Kentucky bourbon makers really what people think of when they hear the word history? But perhaps that's a distinction without a difference. Could it be reductive to assume a history channel has to be about muskets and temples and Nazis? Surely, yesterday is history, so why not explore what happened 50 years ago, or 20, or 5? This philosophical wrestling was at the heart of the History Channel's programming even during its golden era. But even that comes with air quotes, as a long-standing criticism of the channel was the surface-level investigation into its subjects. This meant programming felt like middle school education videos with higher production values. But it was almost 10 years after the channel's debut that a major turn was taken with its programming. The Men Who Killed Kennedy presented itself as an investigation into one of recent history's key events, the assassination of then-President of the United States, John F. Kennedy. But it received such backlash from historians that the channel refused to show it ever again. But now, the die was cast. Scandalous conspiracy stuff was hot, even if it meant the History Channel had to be more careful with possible litigation. One year later, in 2004, Conspiracy aired as a series analyzing historical events with a more, shall we say, bogus point of view. As you'd expect, with conspiracy programming, scandal takes precedent over fact, aesthetics over accuracy. Now, the historical subniche was a convenient justification for platforming historical dubious shows, but it seemed clear that the boost in ratings was the real motivation. However, the History Channel already had another show of similar nature that had flown under the radar just a year earlier in 2003. Ancient Discovery sanitized its conspiratorial edge by presenting itself as a humdrum history show, 
but anyone with a curious eye would have noticed that the lack of a flashy presentation only helped the historical fiction hide in plain sight. So now, the History Channel had learned a thing or two about how to make conspiracy shows, make the history settings farther in the past, and try toning down the Hollywood style. Oh, and don't actually say that it certainly is a conspiracy. From now on, they'll end every program with an expert shrugging their shoulders, asking, but who really knows? No doubt this tidbit came straight from the legal department. But it's here with Ancient Discoveries, the precursor to Ancient Aliens, that we uncover a more subtle shift in their programming. Whereas the hit Ancient Aliens, the popular conspiracy show attempting but failing to explain how aliens built the pyramids and other such nonsense, views ancestral humans as less capable than thought. Ancient Discoveries, on the other hand, represents ancient mankind as smart, ahead of its time, and champion of the technological achievements. This immediately undercuts its own message, as it means that the possibility of extraterrestrial intervention is less likely. This may appease historians interested in truth, but for execs, it was dampening ratings potential. But just before the History Channel went all in on anti-history programming in 2010, there was to be an intermitting period that would put the nail in the coffin. The mid-late 2000s saw an obsession with reality TV. YouTube was still taking off. Twitter was taking flight, and even MySpace was clinging on. That made recession-hit television sectors turn to the far cheaper reality TV landscape, especially as new stars were being born from their TV appearances. Now, for a channel all about history, there is nothing in your mantra to dovetail into reality television. So, some square pegs had to be rounded, stretching once again the Venn diagram of niche logic that had underpinned its early schedule. Pawn Stars barely qualified for the history of objects condition, as the show is heavily skewed toward transactional conflict between pawnbrokers and pawnshop customers. Storage Wars follows a similar suit, where the interpersonal relationship of the host of characters are given more interest and in screen time than any items of history. These would demonstrate that the channel had entered network decay. In short, it means that as a channel broadens its programming to compete with other channels, they eventually become homogenized. Shows become virtually indistinguishable, and niche programming, what was the point of a history channel to begin with, disappeared. This is why it's hard to tell what shows are made for which channel nowadays. Was Pawn Stars and Storage Wars made for the history channel, or were they snapped up before another company could get the rights? It stopped mattering altogether. The history channel had grown in size, and now the engine just needed to be shoveled coal to keep it moving, and it all happened so fast. One second it was Napoleon, Aztecs, and Nazis. The next it was ice truckers, Adam Eats, and swamp people. And why not? You don't need to hire writers, production is so cheap that you can knock out three seasons in a year, plus they get ratings. So after a bit of experimentation, some genre bending, and road testing reality TV, the History Channel went all in on a little show that used the best from each, Ancient Aliens. Since its debut in 2009, the show has had 15 seasons. You might have thought, how can they get blood out of the stone, but somehow those executives stretched this feeble concept over a decade. Perhaps it's helped that one of their lead presenters, I use that word instead of expert, has become a living meme due to his out of the world hair. However they get around with the repetitiveness of each episode, the fact that the channel had revived its in-your-face punchy conspiracy style with reality TV show underpinnings proves the execs have found a winning formula. By abandoning truth altogether, there was no concern to do any meaningful research like with the JFK programming of old. And by regurgitating the same talking heads with the same opinions, they need only adopt reality TV show production values, splice some aerial stock footage of the Egyptian pyramids, and hey, presto, a ratings monster at a fraction of the cost. But the real mark of genius here is how they intercut actual geniuses with nut jobs to present a false balance of ideas, thereby raising its claim to academic authenticity, at least in the eyes of those who are easily duped by the techniques mastered by reality television makers. It lets the History Channel have its cake and eat it too. It's about conspiracies set in ancient times, so that's the history box ticked. They bring in experts to debunk them, which means they have plausible deniability when it comes to journalistic integrity and academic rigor. And the flashy editing, ludicrous claims, and dramatic music is delicious frosting for the eyes and ears. Since then, the History Channel has barely deviated from this new strategy. Its documentaries about founding fathers, the Renaissance, and Nazis are now a thing of the past. But maybe that's what the History Channel wanted to become. 
Not a place to learn about what came before, but a place that exists as an artifact of television history itself, a living fossil fuel of principled programming. Or maybe it's simply another example of how networks are doomed to adapt to the shifting tastes of the audience. Sure, this isn't the most original revelation, but it can be reassuring to know that history repeats itself. If you like this video, then you'll definitely like our video on what historians will hate about us in a hundred years. Don't forget to like and subscribe to keep on learning how history works.